Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I have a few announcements before we begin. Probably the most important announcement is that, although we'll be back in this room next week, the following week we'll finally be back in uh, the Berg Auditorium, which will make life a little bit better for all of us. Uh, upcoming attractions on uh, August 30th, Dr. Marina Bassina is going to be talking on the evolution of diabetes technology from urine test strips to artificial pancreas. Uh, on September 16th, Dean Winslow will talk about uh, from Bagram Airfield to Baghdad and back again. Uh, back in Berg Hall. And on September 13th, Dr. Howard Weiss will talk about a case study of Parkinson's disease in 2017. Uh, today, I'm really pleased to announce that uh, Dr. Jonathan Chen will be giving grand rounds. Jonathan is the newest faculty member in Beamer. He has strong interest in biomedical informatics, started out at UCLA where he got his degree in computer science, went to UC Irvine after some uh, work in industry, uh, where he was part of the MSTP program there and did his PhD in computer science while getting his MD degree. We know him well because he then came to Stanford for house staff training <coughs> and became very excited about order sets and areas where order sets don't work. <laughs> I know not everyone here is excited about order sets, but Jonathan really is. <laughs> and. Uh, as you may know from a previous grand rounds he gave, he talked about his work in looking at how physicians make uh, treatment decisions and whether those treatment decisions can be used to inform the care that uh, physicians give to future patients. But he has lots of other interests. He's interested in the opi opioid epidemic. He's interested in healthcare reform. And for those of us who thought that healthcare reform was finally dead, it may not be. And I'm really glad that we can introduce our newest faculty member in Beamer, Jonathan Chen, to tell us how to understand healthcare reform. Thanks so much, Mark, for the introduction, and thank you all for um, having here this morning. Um, definitely a somewhat strange set of circumstances that had me arrive here. Um, this actually started back when um, David Zvek, one of the university hospitalists, was giving a talk to the residents' new conference about how health insurance works, how payments work. And I talked to um, Nira Huja, the associate program director. Hey, that was a great talk. You know, we should really get more content like that. It would really be great if you found someone who could give us a talk about you know healthcare reform, so we understand what all the national debates and uh, controversies over. Which Nira replied, well, that's a great idea, Jonathan. Why don't you give that lecture? I was like, well, hey, hey, I, said, I, I said someone should do it. Someone should. I didn't say me. Um, I reached out to Jay Bhattacharya at Health Economics, and um, he did do Grand Rounds a month ago, but he decided to cover MACRA and kind of deferred to me to kind of review a little bit of history. You know, what was the healthcare system like before the ACA, the Affordable Care Act? Um, what did the ACA actually set out to do? What actually happened? A little too loud or too low? Um, maybe the, actually it's probably this microphone still on, that's what it is. Is this a little bit better? Give that a try and I'll, I'll pace myself, okay? Um, anyhow, so, and where does that leave us today? So we couldn't quite get the audio to work, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be narrating this video. This is um, a video which you can find off YouTube. It's a very nice review. This was produced about 10 years ago by the Kaiser Family Foundation before the ACA was implemented talking about health reform that's coming to the main street. Um, this was leading up to is the ACA going to get passed and what's going to be in there. Um, the, the law has a, a thousand pages of content there. Who knows what's going on inside? Can we digest it down to something a little bit more manageable that we can follow? Um, and the, the idea being, can we uh, make a little bit more sense of that so that when people are talking to you, you they're not going to talk about you don't know what you're talking about or you don't know what's going on. Um, they're trying to do that. Let these people represent the U.S. population. Each one is about 25 million people. And how do they break down in terms of what they expect or what they think is going to happen? So about a third of people think health care reform will make things better. A third says that's crazy. It's going to make us worse. Um, another third says I have no idea if it's going to make any difference at all. I guess you could say we're so rather than uh, maybe just politicians who have a lot of talk about what's going on, can we just get some information and digest things a little more clearly while answering some basic questions? And you deserve real answers, not the partisan rhetoric and spin we've been flooded with. So let's break down what the reform law does. All right, so let's digest this down into something a little bit more manageable, and that's going to be most of what I'm going to be reviewing. So they're going to first review, and then we'll, we'll cut this off in about a couple of minutes, just kind of the background of some of the problems. Remember, about 10 years ago, before the ACA was implemented, some of the things that were concerning. Problem number one is what problem number one usually is? It's, it's the cost. Um, most people agree that healthcare is problematic in terms of costs. Typical family, to how much does it cost to insure a typical family? It's not like 
$14,000 and only continue to rise. So people are having trouble keeping up with just, that's just the premiums. Um, and aging population only going to be growing even more so. And it's ultimately the largest piece of the federal budget that's continuing to grow, um, outpacing essentially any other form of cost. Um, and there's a lot of holes in the system. If you have pre-existing condition, heart disease, asthma, cancer, um, you're going to be out of luck. Some of the workers are sick, making insurance unaffordable. Um, lifetime caps. If you have a very long-lasting chronic condition, um, you're going to be out of luck as well. That means some of the people least likely to have coverage are the ones who need it most. Nice, huh? High costs and holes in the system mean more than one in seven of us have no health insurance. So a good 15% of the U.S. population was uninsured, had no health insurance at all previously. A um, significant chunk is underinsured. They don't really have much protection in case they get into trouble. Rising costs, federal budgets, um, expenditure, holes in the system, big problems. Wasn't a surprise that people were looking for something to try to make a change. Okay. A little bit more background. Uh, what I actually, because it was really the fundamental problem is that healthcare is expensive. Healthcare in the U.S. in particular is extremely expensive. Uh, right now, Starbucks spends more money on healthcare expenses than they do on buying coffee beans. GM spends more money on healthcare than they do buying steel to build cars. Um, compared to the second most expensive nation in the world, the U.S. spends 40% more of its GDP and per person on healthcare expenses. Um, and yet, by many measures of population health, we don't even do that well. Um, and this has only continued to grow and escalate, no end in sight to healthcare expenses. Well, the guy on the left here is showing here is back in 1950, about 5% of the U.S. economy was spent on health care. By today, it's 17, 18%. Basically, one in every six dollars is spent on health care. If nothing changes, another 70 years, 40% of our economy will be spent just on health care. You haven't even put a roof over your head. You haven't put food on the table. It imagine 40% of your paycheck is just gone just covering health care expenses. Um, although, actually, the ACA didn't necessarily set out to change that much about that. What it was really going after was about insurance, whether you knew about people who are getting um, health insurance coverage. Um, so this was what the layout was like, again, before the ACA's path, back in 2010. Most of us got our health insurance through our employer. In fact, it's a little bit strange because of that, and that's why I think there's actually a lot of inertia in healthcare reform, because most of us are actually pretty happy getting health insurance through our employer. We get a significant tax break by doing so. In fact, one of the largest um, and, and strangest um, tax breaks um, in, in the tax code, even more so than the mortgage interest deduction, that like, the richer you are, the more of a, a higher paying job you get, the bigger of a break you get. Um, there are also people on Medicare, so the elderly, um, for example, they're actually pretty happy with the system. Um, you also have a bunch of people on Medicaid. I used to think that was like insurance for poor people. Um, before the ACA, being poor was not good enough. You had to also basically be, not be able to work. So you're a child, you're disabled, you're mentally ill, you're pregnant, for example. If you were a able-bodied but childless adult but poor, you were still out of luck. The, the Medicaid was not designed to help you. Really what they were trying to do was go after the uninsured. So previously about 50% of the population, 50 million people um, had no health insurance coverage um, in the US. Um, a lot of those were children, a lot of them were working families, all those who be unfair. Also a good chunk of those were undocumented immigrants, which even the ACA was not designed to help. So if we want to figure out how to approach this problem, some, some concepts that are worth understanding. Uh, the cost of healthcare is extremely, extremely skewed. So the x-axis, that's the whole US population. Y-axis, the cumulative cost it takes to take care of those people. If we only had to take care of the bottom half, that'd be easy. Right? We cost like 3% of all the budget. I mean, we don't have to talk about it. That's easy to do. Almost all the drama, the angst is over, what do you do about the top 1% of people who cost 30% of the expensive? Half of all healthcare expenses are consumed by just 5% of the population. And so the way, the simple way I conceptualize the problem, what the angst is, who wants that hot potato? Who's going to take care of the cost of those expensive patients? Nobody wants it. Everybody's trying to punt that on to somebody else. Right. So how would we even think through how we might try to approach that? Um, what we got down here is a breakdown of health, wealth, and equity. There is no such thing as a perfect healthcare system. Some people might call this cost, quality, and access. They're always pushing and pulling against each other. You cannot optimize all three of these things at the same time uh, because fundamentally, healthcare is a scarce resource. As a doctor, there's only so many patients you can see in a given day, right? So with, with that in mind, every time you try to help and pull in one direction, you probably broke something on the other side. So, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I wanted to break for a little conceptual thought. Think about what is the purpose of health insurance? Why do you buy it? Uh, why do you get insurance in general? Let's say you bought a computer or an appliance or a smartphone. Uh, they like to sell you an extended warranty on that, right? So in terms of expected value, in terms of actual value, expected value, sh should you buy that insurance? 
the, the answer is no. You, you should never buy the extended warranty uh, because the whole point is the expected value of that transaction is net negative. You know you don't want it because somebody wants to sell it to you, right? They are expecting on average, they have to make more money from you than they're giving back to you. Um, if that's the case, why would you want health insurance then? The, what you're really doing is you're trying to protect yourself from the extreme swings and wide variance of healthcare costs. I mean, like, look at me right now, I'm, I'm relatively healthy right now. Um, I haven't, I'm, this is actually true, I haven't seen a doctor in like seven years. But um, <laughs> you, you know, so, so my health insurance in the past seven years has been totally wasted, all that money spent, I've gotten no value out of it. Uh, but what if tomorrow I get hit by a car or I, I get diagnosed with cancer or inflammatory bowel disease or something that could suddenly make my healthcare costs become catastrophically expensive? I'm trying to protect myself from that risk. So that's fair, okay, so maybe that's what health insurance is meant to do. But then what do you do about pre-existing conditions? Um, so it's so a real life story. Um, our, our first child was born just as we were um, coming out of medical school. And so there, we had a, a brief gap in our health insurance. My wife said, well, I'll just go you know, buy some individual insurance for a while to cover that difference. Um, they picked up the phone and said, like, oh, you're pregnant right now and you want health insurance? They just hung up the phone on her basically, right? I, I, imagine, I, uh, health insurance protecting me from that new diagnosis of cancer or a car crash. What happens next year? I come to renew my healthcare policy. Remember I change jobs. Maybe I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to go into private practice. I want to take care of my own health insurance now. But now I go up to the health insurance company. Wait a second. That's like saying I'd like to buy some fire insurance while my house is already on fire. Right? That just doesn't make sense. There's no logical, rational business reason someone's going to sell health insurance to you. There's no more gamble. There's no more bet to be made. It's entirely predictable that you're going to be expensive to take care of. And because of that, it's entirely predictable that um, insurance companies are going to perform medical underwriting and or rescission. So, so what is this? This is, hey, before you renew your healthcare policy, before you buy a new one, let's get, take a look at a questionnaire you fill out. Let's look at your medical records. Wait a second, wait a second. Two years ago, you complained to your doctor that you had some low back pain. What if you have a chronic pain problem? Uh, I don't think we want this. Uh, a few years ago, you, have, you were an antidepressant for a couple years after your mom died. Ooh, what if you have some mental health issues? We, we, we don't want to take, take this risk. Uh, we're not going to offer you health insurance. And to some degree, ultimately, this has to be somewhat of a moral or pragmatic decision that you as individuals and a society have to decide whether that seems right to you. Um, if, if we do that, are we just fundamentally just discriminating against the people who actually need healthcare coverage the most? Um, and if that's the case, then almost what's the point of even having a healthcare system? Uh, assuming you even buy into that argument, well, what can you do about it? We well, might think we need some laws and regulation. I want guaranteed issues. So what does that mean? That means healthcare um, insurance companies cannot turn you away from having pre-existing condition. They have to offer you insurance. Well, okay, if I'm the insurance company, then I'll just charge you 10 times more than the next guy so I can make up for the expected cost. Well, if, if the pricing is that extreme, eventually it's not affordable. It's not really being offered. So, so again, what's the point? So you think maybe we need more laws and regulations. I want community rating. You cannot discriminate against people for based on pre-existing conditions. Everybody in the community is gonna be charged the same amount um, to, to make that more fair. Right? Well, okay, the insurance company, then fine. I'll just strip down your benefits. So a $10,000 deductible, maximum payout of $50,000. Um, I'm only covering hospitalizations, no prescription drugs, no outpatient services. Eventually, you'll be chopped down enough of the benefits. Again, it's like, well, why, why even bother offering anything at all? You're not really offering anything. So maybe we need more rules. How about define essential health benefits? What kind of is the minimum standard that counts as health insurance even? So if we got all this structure in place, and there actually were some states even before the ACA came out that basically did this, um, but they had to back off because uh, this, if you just do this, things are, you're gonna get into trouble basically because of adverse selection. So what is that about? So, so imagine all these laws are in place. I'm pretty healthy right now. Um, what, what am I even paying for health insurance for? I, I've gotten no value out of it over the past seven years. I'll, I'll just, I'll just I, I don't need it. So maybe I'll get sick tomorrow. That's fine. I'll just sign up for health insurance tomorrow, right? The insurance company can't turn me away. They have to guarantee me a fair rate. So why would I bother signing up now when I don't need it? Um, so what's going to happen is a lot of the healthy people are not going to bother signing up for insurance. Who is going to sign up for it? Uh, the sick people, the chronically ill, the, the expensive people are going to sign up for insurance because they're the ones who are actually using it. Um, and now, because the insurance companies can't not discriminate against the sicker, they have to raise premiums and prices on everybody just to balance their books. So now imagine I'm a relatively healthy person in the insurance pool. Wait a second, all these prices on insurance are going up and I barely even use it. I don't want to play anymore. Take me out. I don't want to be in the insurance pool anymore. I'm just going to uh, work on my own. So now what happens? Your insurance pool becomes even more concentrated with the chronically ill, sick, expensive people to take care of. You end up in the adverse selection death spiral. So what could you try to do about that? If you want something like this to work, you've got to have something like a universal coverage or an initial mandate to basically force people to have insurance, even though this is extremely, extremely unpopular. The most hated thing about the ACA, for sure. Um, so you all know the individual mandate, right? If you don't have health insurance coverage, you've got to figure out some way to get it. Um, if you don't, you're going to be hit with a penalty. 
Um, even if we got all that in place, so now are, are we done? Is healthcare reform a resolve problem? Let's move on to tax reform or something, right? There's just nothing really to worry about. Uh, th this has still done nothing to address uh, fundamental issues of affordability. Instead of healthcare being catastrophically expensive for a few people, maybe it is now just aggravatingly expensive for all people. Um, so let's dig into a little bit what the ACA properly called Obamacare. What, what did it try to do? There's a ton of stuff it, it did, uh, most of which you've never heard of. Uh, you know, they encouraged doctors going to primary care, close the donut hole in Medicare Part D prescriptions, more quality reporting and, and uh, transparency um, in, in our accountable care organizations, the experiments like this to try to save some money. You, you don't hear about any of this. Most of this stuff is not controversial. Almost all the talk you hear about is just in the titles about how does health insurance work and how it's gonna be paid for. So let's dig into that, the major insurance impacts of the ACA. So from now on, it is now guaranteed issue, community rating. You cannot be discriminated against for having a pre-existing condition. The only thing you can adjust insurance um, costs by is um, if you're a smoker and by age, and it's maximum one to three ratio. An older person can only be charged three times as much as a younger person. So does that mean an older person pays less, or does that mean a younger person pays more? It, it, it basically means both. Um, it, one of the key actual distinctions now, the ACA more or less redefined what counts as health insurance by defining what are essential health benefits. From now on, there are maximums on what your out-of-pocket pay is gonna be. Um, no more annual lifetime caps can be enforced. There's now a minimum actuarial value. The 60% is the bronze quality plan. So what that means is after you've paid all your co-pays and your premiums, your deductibles, on average, you expect 60% of that at least to come back to you in terms of medical claims. Um, there's also now a minimum medical loss ratio. So all the premiums you paid here insurance, the 80% of that has to go back on average to pay for medical claims. The insurance companies only have 20% to work with for their administrative and profit um, issues. Um, there are also now a battery of 10 essential health benefits um, uh, described. So um, you, you can't discriminate against women anymore. So you have to cover maternity care, and you have to cover birth control pills, um, hospitalizations, rehab, laboratory services, um, all have to be a part of what's covered. Okay. In order to make that um, system uh, work together, right? When I first heard about the individual mandate, my instinct was that's that's wrong, that's bad. I, I don't know how else to describe that, but that is un-American. You, you can't you can't force somebody to buy something they don't want. Um, but as I mentioned before, if you follow that chain of logic. If you want pre-existing conditions to be covered, you have to have something like the individual mandate. The system will unravel unless you have both. They are inextricably tied together. Um, and so the ACA implemented the individual and the employer mandate. If you're an employer, you have 50 or more employees, you have to give them health insurance now, otherwise pay $2,000 per head. Or if you're an individual, um, you pay up to 2.5% of your income in a tax penalty if you don't have insurance. So does that close the loop? So th th there's, there's still issues. So what presidential candidate about 10 years ago in 2008 said the individual mandate is a bad idea, doesn't make sense. Th that's like mandating people to stop being homeless. And, and, and so what, if this person remains homeless, you're gonna hit them with a penalty? Like that, that doesn't make sense. I don't have a home, I don't have health insurance. Not because I don't want it, it's because I can't afford it. Right? So who, who said that? Th th this was Barack Obama criticizing Hillary Clinton's plan in 2008, saying that the individual mandate didn't make sense. Clearly, once he came into presidency, um, his advisors were able to change his mind. So like, this isn't just not gonna work unless you have a structure like that. Um, but what they did account for is, well, if, if you're basically too poor to afford insurance, what's the point of mandating that you get it? So they try to find some subsidies or structures to help people get it. So uh, a major expansion of Medicaid. Remember, it used to be being poor wasn't good enough before. You had to also be basically disabled or unable to work. Now, just if you're poor, less than 138% of the poverty line, um, you can get into Medicaid, and the, the feds are gonna pay almost all of the cost for that. 90% plus of the cost of, of that expansion. If you're in the low to middle income range, up to 400% of the poverty line, um, you'll get at least some help. You'll get some help subsidies for your premiums or cost sharing deductions to help you deal with deductibles and co-pays. And um, at the low end, you're practically gonna get free insurance at that point. Up to 400% of the poverty line, you'll at least get some help, and the amount of help you get is targeted towards you getting a silver quality plan, 70% actual or value about what you're expecting to get back. Okay, okay sounds good, but what is this gonna cost? Um, so over the course of 10 years, a good trillion plus dollars in terms of um, helping expand Medicaid and subsidies to help people buy insurance on the individual markets. Um, you're gonna get a little bit of money back through like the individual mandate, employer mandate. These are people who are still saying, that they're expecting to say, I, I don't want your insurance. I'd rather pay a penalty than have it. Um, so how are you gonna pay for a trillion dollars of cost here? Uh, you don't hear about it much, but actually most of this came from essentially cuts to Medicare. Um, they implemented essentially a capitation program in terms of how much Medicare grows, particularly targeting the Medicare 
Medicare Advantage programs. Um, and so you'll actually see back in, in history, if you look, look at things, there'll be political sniping points to say, look at this, the, the, the ACA rated Medicare to fund this, this crazy experiment. Um, and yet, essentially, you hear nobody talking about undoing this because everyone knows that the costs are just out of control. You've, you've got to do something. Otherwise, beyond that, you also need some taxes, some revenues. So you tax health insurers, pharmaceuticals, medical device um, um, companies. So what's interesting to me is uh, those are all powerful lobbying groups. How do you get a law passed that where you can tax them? Uh, the, the whole conceit is they were part of writing the law. They knew that more people are going to be insured, more people in the system. They, are, they, they fully expect to make more money than they're going to be taxed. And anything they can tax, they can also transfer onto the consumer relatively easily. Just so you've heard of it, the Cadillac tax. It almost doesn't matter because this keeps getting pushed back. So again, a very strange aberrancy in US healthcare. Most of us get insurance through our employer. We get a tax break in terms of getting that benefit. Um, and so that can lead to strange aberrant behavior where people say, well, it doesn't cost me anything. I might as well get another MRI at my back just, just because somebody else is paying for it. So Cadillac tax, basically start imposing a tax on excessively generous employer-sponsored health insurance plans. But this is extremely politically unpopular. It keeps getting pushed back, deferred and deferred, because most of us are on employer-sponsored insurance and do not want to be affected by any reforms. Otherwise, where's the other gap in the money coming from? It's going to come from, from rich people. I mean, look at this picture. Look at this guy. He's got his like sunglasses on. I don't, I don't know what this guy's wearing this cap for. I think he just sailed in on his yacht. He's going home to his family mansion with like money just flying out of his chimney. Um, so just, just to be clear, th this is not somebody else. If you are or are going to be a practicing physician, th this, this is you. Um, families with uh, 250000 or more in income, um, from now on, you're getting additional tax on your high income and also the first time your passive investment investment income is going to be taxed for healthcare purposes. So the major point of all this was to try to figure out how to deal with people who are uninsured. So left here, these were the original Congressional Budget Office projections. How good a job does the CBA do at predicting the future? Versus on the left, um, and the blue is essentially where we're actually at in terms of health insurance. The orange hash marks is <clears throat> what would have happened had the ACA never passed. Had it never passed, we still would have about 50 million people uninsured. Instead, we're down to about 27. Um, Employer-sponsored health insurance essentially unaffected, and that was the whole point by design. They, they, they knew that you couldn't pass anything if you affected that. Um, what was interesting is not as many people signed up for those individual health insurance exchanges as people thought they would. Instead, you ended up with a lot more people in Medicaid than was originally projected. All right, break for some conceptual thought here. So dealing with the uninsured, is this a moral or is this a pragmatic problem? Even if people don't have health insurance, they can still get health care. Um, you can still go into a clinic and pay out, uh, pay out of cash, or maybe go to a county clinic. Um, and Tala Law, if you go to the emergency room, they can't turn you away. So they still receive maybe about 65% of the health care that an insured person would. Um, what's interesting about that also is where does that uh, come from? Some of it's out there out-of-pocket payments, but even if you don't pass a law that says I'm going to tax you to help other people get insurance, it, it's going to happen anyway, right, through cross-subsidization, the hidden tax. So about $1,000 of your family's health care premiums are going to help pay for the uninsured, right? Because if you were to walk into Stanford Hospital and get admitted and they give you a pill of Tylenol to treat something, they're going to charge 10 bucks for that pill of Tylenol. What, what on earth? That, that thing doesn't cost 10 cents. What are they doing? Um, the whole idea is when, say, an uninsured person comes into the hospital and gets treated, no one's ever going to pay that bill. The hospital's got to recoup that cost somehow. So what they do is they charge people with commercial insurance much more than they need to to kind of balance that out. Here's another thought, a narrative to think about. You know what? Having people uninsured, that's, that's just so inefficient. Um, you know, they, 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 don't, they can't get a regular doctor, um, so in tall law, they'll just go to the emergency room just to refill their thyroid medicine, just get a basic urinary tract infection uh, taken care of. That is so inefficient. The ER is such an expensive and wasteful place to get basic care taken up. Just give these people insurance. Just give them Medicaid, and it'll be a win-win overall. Everyone will save money. That would really just be better for everyone, right? So really interesting, the Oregon experiment. They, uh, Oregon, the state of Oregon expanded who was eligible for Medicaid, but um, they still didn't have enough money to actually get all those people on health insurance. So um, they had to randomly deploy a lottery. Uh, we'll give it to you guys. Uh, the rest of you will we'll get to you eventually. Um, very interesting because that's about as close as you're going to ever get to a real world natural experiment to randomize control trial. What is the effect of giving uninsured people Medicaid? Um, amongst the many findings they have, which I'll, I'll review in detail, one particularly interesting one was um, you give people Medicaid, they go to the emergency room even more often, actually. They, there is, uh, the evidence, there is no scenario where covering more people with insurance net saves society money. That does not mean it's a good or bad thing to do, but there's no easy, free win-win that happens. You have to spend money to give them that benefit, and you have to decide if that benefit is worthwhile. Um, and just because you 
your numbers look better. Like we've got all these more people insured. Um, just because you have a card that says you have health insurance does not necessarily entail that you have good access to high quality health care. Uh, Medicaid is often limited as being the most comprehensive health care insurance on paper, but perhaps the worst in reality. Uh, and why is that? Because of paperwork, bureaucracy, and basically because the payments are, are not very good. They'll on average pay on maybe half of what a commercial insurer would pay. So many doctors just don't want to accept Medicaid patients. Um, even tougher if you need to see a specialist, you need to see a dentist, uh, you need to see a psychiatrist, less than half a psychiatrist will take Medicaid patients. Uh, with that in mind then, if you give people Medicaid then, does that make a difference? Does that actually improve any health outcomes? Is there a point to this? Um, so uh, there has been reviews of some of the literature and some of the studies have been done. The Oregon experiment is probably the closest thing you'll get to a randomized control trial, a lot of observational quasi-experimental evidence as well. Uh, what does seem pretty clearly true, you definitely help people with protecting their financial security. People won't go bankrupt anymore um, when they're trying to get medical care. Um, they do have better access to care than when they're uninsured, and they definitely use more health care than they would have otherwise, even if it's not necessarily efficient, but, but could be. Maybe you get more screening and diagnosis, general management of chronic diseases, maybe better outcomes for um, depression uh, and self-reported health. But how about some uh, hard objective medical outcomes, even just like better hemoglobin A1C management, blood pressure management, uh, not so clear that it makes any difference at all. How about mortality? Are we going to save lives when we provide insurance? Evidence not so clear about that, actually. The, the, probably the closest thing you'll get is some quasi-experimental studies where like one state expanded Medicaid, one did not. What were the differences there? And there it applies that maybe um, some lives will be saved. And if so, the number needed to treat, the number people we have to give insurance to is maybe about 300 to save one life. And yet, even then, things didn't quite work out the way anyone intended it to. So Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act, um, the individual mandate is constitutional. It's basically just another tax the federal government's uh, laying out on you. Um, but the federal government cannot force states to expand Medicaid coverage. Um, as a result, many states did, but many states did not play. They said, I don't, I don't, I don't want to expand our eligibility for who gets Medicaid. Um, and I have to say, that seems, I have a hard time digesting that because it, it's almost like free money from the government, right? 90% uh, plus of the cost is supposed to come to the feds. Why would they not bother expanding? Um, the best I can put together, other than just simply ideology, is um, some governor said, even though the feds pay most of the costs, the state still has to pay some, and, and we, we just can't afford it, even if we wanted to. And, and sure, right now, the feds say they'll pay almost all the costs, but what if, say, someone wanted to, I don't know, repeal and replace Obamacare? Suddenly, maybe um, the states are going to be stuck holding the bag on all these um, additional people in Medicaid that they're not going to get the support for. What about... Um, Individual market stability, is Obamacare going to implode before it explodes? So if you, previously, in order for a health insurance market to work, estimates were you need about 40% of the population in the insurance pool to be the young adults, the young invincibles, healthy people. Um, instead, only about 28% of such people showed up to the individual exchange markets. And so most of the health insurance companies who participated in the exchanges in the first couple of years, they lost hundreds of millions of dollars because they miscalculated how many um, people, uh, healthy versus chronically ill people, were going to show up. Um, there's also a very active policy uncertainty about what's going to happen to the laws and how they're enforced, and which I'll get to in a bit. The net result of this is um, the counties in red um, are some that, as of 2018, could be the first year ever where there will not be a single health insurer left playing on the individual exchange market, um, just because the insurance is like, this, this is costing us too much money, there's too much uncertainty, why, why do we want to play? We're, 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 we're out. Um, and any who are staying are raising their premiums on average maybe 22%. Um, one state, Iowa, almost the entire state was not going to have an insurer left. Uh, one company did stick it out, but they're increasing the rates 57%. Um, I, I'm trying to unravel because it hasn't happened before, but what would happen in a state where there was, or a county where there just was no health insurer left in the individual exchange markets? From what I can gather, you, you can still buy health insurance. You just go off exchange. You can go straight to a health insurance company, just like before the ACA was passed. Uh, there's some difference in what's required to be enforced there, but I, really I think the key distinction is you cannot access those federal subsidies, uh, cost sharing reductions to help you pay for that insurance because the system was, just, was not designed that way. It assumed you were buying your insurance through the exchange markets. Uh, there, there's this glitch here that it wasn't expecting this to happen. All right, I'm going to go through some of this quickly because at this point, some of these reform laws seem to have stalled, but just dig in a little bit more on some of the components of it because they're worth understanding why people are talking about them. So the uh, first column, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, commonly called Obamacare, that's what's in place right now. The American Health Care Act, that was the plan that was passed by the House back in May. Uh, Better Care and Reconciliation Act was the bill that the Senate uh, was trying to put together, but ultimately did not pass, um, ironically because some senators thought it was too conservative and some thought it was not conservative enough. Um, so what are some of the pieces in there? 
what seemed to get people most riled up was, was actually that uh, uh, Medicaid, basically. Phase out expansion and also essentially put a capitation system on how much medication grows. The net effect is, although not literally a cut, functionally over 10 years, it would be a much reduced um, outlays to Medicaid and the states would have to start cutting people off of the service because they wouldn't be able to afford it. Um, they still have a lot of the structural similarities to um, the ACA, maybe just a little bit less generous. Subsidies are still there, they just uh, hit different targets. Uh, what about pre-existing conditions, guaranteed issue, community rating? Um, so the key distinction is they added the option for state waivers and or a consumer choice amendment, where if, a, say, an insurance company offers the good essential health benefits plan, they can also offer a really cheap, skimpy disaster plan. This is, this is worth unpacking a little bit more. So doesn't that seem good? I mean, that's more choice to the consumers, right? I mean, do I need maternity care and birth control pills? What do I have to pay for this fancy healthcare plan that covers all these benefits that I'm never gonna use? I, I mean, does it look like I'm gonna use substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment? You know, maybe don't answer that question. But <laughs> it, it, even if that were possible, uh, why, why am I paying for all these benefits that I'm just never gonna use or I don't expect to use? You know, let the insurance companies have the freedom to put together a very simple, very cheap, and inexpensive healthcare plan, I'll be happy to buy that one because I'm pretty healthy. I don't even, I don't use healthcare anyway. Um, so let's just think through what would happen if you did do that. Um, if you had these two types of or tiers of healthcare plans, who's gonna sign up for the good one? It's the people who are gonna use it, right? The people who need those services and the healthy people will start to naturally just be driven uh, out to the cheaper plans. Um, it's adverse selection again and the costs here are gonna um, get spiral out of control just as you would expect otherwise. Um, everybody wants to get rid of the individual mandate. They not say have a great way to kind of figure out an alternative to it, though. Um, a lot of the drama was, oh, they see the Obamacare, it's, it's, it's imploding, this market instability. Um, CBO projects, if nothing changes, there will be a small number of counties where it will just be out. There will be no health insurers left because mostly policy uncertainty because the insurers don't know what's gonna happen and they don't wanna take a chance. Um, the proposed plans uh, actually don't seem to make that better. In fact, they probably make it worse because they were gonna take away the individual mandate and have these waivers that would um, reduce essential health benefits coverage. Um, key thing, all these taxes and fees on high income people and the medical industry, wait a minute, isn't that where I work? Um, all, all, all those taxes, we're, we're, they were, we wanted to repeal those to make it look not so bad. The final version of the Senate bill, they, they were gonna keep the taxes on high income people. Um, briefly cover a couple of the other efforts they tried to squeeze through when that one didn't work. Um, the Obamacare Repeal Reconciliation Act, so repeal and delay, uh, a bill that was passed by Congress back in 2015, uh, but promptly just vetoed by Barack Obama. Um, now, in some sense, when the vote like actually counted, because there was a president who actually would sign off on the bill, um, the Senate was not able to pass that one. They tried maybe, how about the Health Care Freedom Act, the skinny repeal. Can we all just agree that we just hate the individual mandate? Let's at least just repeal that. Um, couldn't, couldn't quite make that work um, either. So with this, what would this have done to costs? Um, it would have been 800 billion less for Medicaid, less for subsidies. You'll, make, you'll, you'll offer some funds back for stability. You're gonna not charge people these penalty payments more, and basically you're gonna give people back all those tax revenues that you used to collect. Uh, what would have happened to the uninsured rate in the US? So on that timeline on the left here, before the ACA, we were hovering just around maybe 15 plus percent of the US population without health insurance. Uh, after the ACA, we're down to about 10% of the population. If nothing changes, we'll just hover around there. We're, it's not gonna get any better. Uh, this is still not universal healthcare coverage. Um, had the uh, Senate plan or the repeal plan passed, uh, basically we would have um, gone back to uh, where we were before, if not worse. And if you look at the bottom, where that breakdown is, it's mostly people off Medicaid. Uh, all the individual exchange programs, many people just equate that with being Obamacare. Um, it's almost a relatively small player in what's going on. And arguably that's also freedom right there. This is people deciding, if you don't put that pan mandate, that penalty on me, I will gladly choose to not have health insurance. So that's where we're at. Uh, sum up some still on, even though not necessarily pushing it as hard, there's still uh, a lot of policy uncertainty and things that can happen that are unresolved issues. For example, is the individual mandate um, gonna even be enforced? So it, it turns out, if you fill out your tax returns, you, there's a box say, do I have health insurance or not? Because if you don't, I, you need to pay a penalty, right? It, it turns out if you just leave that field blank, the, the IRS is just not gonna do anything about it. Um, this was a year that was the first time they were gonna start enforcing it. They were gonna return your tax return unless you fill that section out. Um, one of the first executive orders that Trump signed when he came into office, all federal agencies, be as lenient as possible, do not enforce anything that has to do with the ACA. So the IRS says, well, okay, if people leave a blank, we're just not gonna bother um, asking. 
Um, uh, another point of contention, federal cost sharing reduction. Those are the things that help um, low to middle income people pay for their deductibles or co-pays. A uh, Congress filed a lawsuit successfully um, a couple years ago that said there's a technicality that the, the ACA did not appropriate that money properly. Um, a judge upheld that ruling, but then the executive branch under Obama appealed that and said, well, let, let's hold off on that until we can figure out what to do, but we'll keep paying that in the meantime. Technically, Trump has inherited that responsibility and is continuing to pay those cost sharing reductions out, but it, it conceptually, in theory, he doesn't, he doesn't have to. He could drop the appeal and, and just um, have, stop paying those out. If that were to happen, or if the, even the threat of that were to happen, the insurance company is going to say, I, we are going to increase our premiums 10 to 20 percent to make up for that risk. Um, and ironically, although the government would save $10 billion by not paying these cost sharing reductions, they'd actually pay out more $12 billion in premium subsidies because the premium is going to go up so much on all the people who are covered. And again, to reiterate, none of all the stuff we talked about has done anything to address fundamental issues of healthcare affordability. Um, and in fact, now that you have more people who are subsidized and are essentially insulated from the cost of healthcare, maybe you have even more risk of moral hazard. You know, this, this, somebody comes, I'd like to buy an MRI for my low back pain, even though it's not cost effective, there's no value to it, but I'm not paying for it, so you know, what do I care? Okay, that's the main sum of what I wanted to cover. Um, I wasn't going to go so, so much over what happens to doctors, but just a, a brief aside about that. What can you expect to happen to you? For it, the, the silent majority, people on employer-sponsored health insurance, you're probably not going to be affected by almost any of this stuff. And that was by design, because they knew you wouldn't accept it. Um, for doctors, um, expect just more EMRs, accountability, quality process portion, uh, documenting, care standardization, bean counters who've never touched a patient before in their life trying to tell you how to do your job, less money making through fee-for-service services, and um, ultimately, you probably can't be a private practice doctor anymore. You have to sell out to be a hospital employee because you need the bargaining power to maintain your reimbursements and your quality of life. I'm gonna close out with this quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes here. This is from Bob Walker. He's the chair of medicine over at UCSF. He talks to his uh, new medical students and says, y you've got to understand, you are entering a profession that's being transformed like coal into diamonds under the pressures of new mandates. The world is going to push you relentlessly and without mercy to provide the highest quality, the safest, the most satisfying care at the lowest cost. To which one of his medical students said, uh, what exactly was you trying to do before? <laughs> Let me close it out there. <clears throat> For the record, the views expressed during this talk do not necessarily represent those of any institution nor this speaker. Um, here's a ton of references you can look up to review anything I talked about. Otherwise, I'll be glad to uh, open the floor to comments because I know you've got them, and hopefully all these terms on this slide make sense to you at this point. So the question was, um, universal Medicare, single payer, Medicare for all. There's, there's that more attention to it now because a lot of these reform efforts seem to have stalled. Um, it is quite interesting because, let me back up a few steps. It, technically, the, the ACA kind of actually is the conservative health care plan. Um, it came out of the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, implemented by Mitt Romney, a conservative a Republican governor. Um, the, the very liberal idea for universal health care is single payer, Medicare for all, right? Um, they couldn't do it 10 years ago. I don't think they can do it now, certainly with um, the, the, the current Congress. And um, as much as anyone can guess, I actually think it's going to be very hard for that to happen anytime soon because actually I think the underlying issue is the, the silent majority. Most of us have employer-sponsored health insurance, a very nice tax break. Why would we want the system to change? Um, maybe something that could happen as a middle ground, like a, a public option in exchange markets. Um, I, I don't know the answer. This is um, be best guesses. I might possibly have missed a couple one of your points. If you like. No worries. But I just, I just wanted to uh, assert one thing is I thought that one of the measures of a society is how well it's treated. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to keep that in mind. And with, with that in mind, I wonder if anybody's looking at some of the non health care costs or savings of the. Um, of of what they tried in Oregon, that is children able to go to school and people able to keep jobs and the things that you think that help affect. Right. Um, you got it. So the basic, the, the common question was, 
Um, the, for example, the Oregon experiment, just because it didn't necessarily change the, the health outcome, did it give you other benefits, societal benefits, that would be measured in different ways, for example, like being able to go to work or go to school, for example. I don't know that anyone's looked specifically um, at that, but there were some things that were clear, like basically protecting yourself from financial instability. Um, there are less people going bankrupt, basically, as a result of that, and presumably that's helping them societally as well. Um, so there probably is some benefit there. I don't think anyone specifically studied that. If anyone in the room knows better, I'm happy to open it up. Um, so the, the question comment is, wait, what about spiraling costs of medications, for example? Is there anything in here to do something about that? Uh, basically, no. Um, they, that, that's something that's an ongoing uh, point of contention. For what it's worth, um, prescription drugs actually only account for maybe 10 to 20 percent of total cost, so that's not really the whole story, but definitely a potential area to go after. Maybe in theory, if you had a single payer, you'd have much more uh, you know, brute bargaining power to force companies to, to charge you less, but maybe then people don't want to bother inventing new drugs for you anymore because they can't make that much money off it. So there's, there's always trade-offs you've got to think about. Um, and if you go recently, Kevin Shulman gave a great grand rounds maybe a month ago talking about, like, say, PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, yeah, that, that could basically charge, increase everybody's premium 124 bucks a year just to get 5% of the population treated, for example. And, and, and no one's accounted for how do you afford that? I, I think I saw three hands, sorry. I, I think maybe you were first, actually. Mm -hmm. um, a great comment, let me try to encapsulate some of it. Um, it, it doesn't seem feasible. How can you not have a cap on, say, lifetime expenses? Because that could, in theory, grow to infinity, right? And it, it essentially, we have to have a conversation. Um, one great comment um, I saw was, um, I, I've, I've never met a doctor who says, I could do my job for any less pay. I've never met a hospital executive who said, I can keep the hospital running on any less reimbursement. And I've also never met a patient who said, I'm willing to accept less access to every newest uh, technology in medical care. So uh, uh, unless we have a, a hard conversation, how are we going to really get anywhere um, necessarily? Uh, for what's about the lifetime cap specifically, I haven't reviewed that specifically, but when I reviewed with Jay Bhattacharya, the health economics professor, um, he said, although that's an interesting point, it, it actually that ends up not having that big an effect on in terms of total health expenditure costs, because there's, there's not that many people on that extreme end. So worth paying attention to, but um, at least what he described to me, it didn't seem to be something he was as concerned about. But the hard conversation, I would say, does still need to happen. Question, cost sharing reduction, who gets that money? Let me, let me ask you a different question. Your employer um, takes care of your health insurance, right? Who pays for that insurance? Your, your employer paid for you, right? I don't have to worry about health insurance. They paid it for me. No, that's not right. You are still paying for it. They could have paid you more wages if they weren't doing that, but they're doing this because it's basically, um, there's a better tax benefit to giving you it this way. So cost sharing reductions, the way it's structured, and I think this is the technicality for why they got into trouble, was technically the patient never actually sees that money. Instead, what happened was the insurers, if they insure a, a poorer person, they will say, oh, we're going to make sure your deductibles and your co-pays are very low, because then the federal governments will fill in the gap for us um, at the end of the year, um, if, if that makes sense. So, so the patients they never actually even saw that money. All they saw was the insurance company charged them less. And so that's why it looks like an insurance company bailout, because the money is technically going from the feds to the insurance company. I, I think I might have saw this one first. Yeah. So here in California, we have a lot of consumer protection things like the shampoo or the moisturizer. And where are we on this idea? 
Um, none of, <coughs> excuse me, none of the recent proposals mention anything about selling insurance across state lines. Um, and I, again, I, I'm not as much an expert at this, again, talking to Jay about Acharya, he, he thinks that's almost an irrelevant talking point. Um, even before the, a, the ACA passed, there were cross-state sales possible in some states, but nobody bothered to take advantage of that. Because what does an insurer in Wyoming, what do they know about setting up a network of doctors in California? They have no idea how to do that, so why would they even bother trying, basically? So it'd be interesting to set up um, interstate exchanges, but uh, at least his history would tell us that it wouldn't make much difference even if you did it. I don't get myself in trouble here, but the question was, um, European countries, they can provide universal health care coverage and they, they spend like half what we do. How, how are they able to do that and we can't? Um, that, that's actually a really complicated question. I definitely don't have all the answers to that one, but it's not just about health care coverage. It's a lot about um, premium pricing in the, in the U.S. Is, um, if the pharmaceutical companies invest a new drug, they've got to make money off of somebody, and it turns out the U.S. is the place to make it, um, for example, versus other countries have much more price controls, for example. That's just one example. That's actually a really deep, complicated question that involves more than I feel I'm capable of answering. If anyone else, else wants to jump in, I'm happy to let them do so. I, I've got this one first, and I'll get you to come. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so that was one of the proposals as part of some of the recent uh, plans. Hey, state waivers, you know, free, uh, freedom choice amendment. But in case you are really expensive, very ill, we'll set a separate pool of those state stability funds to protect people in those high risk areas so it's not catastrophically expensive for you. Um, the idea seems sort of right. Those did exist even before the ACA was passed. Um, usually there wasn't enough money to actually um, make them sustainable. You ended up very quickly uh, who on, the, on, those, on those wait lists, basically it was like, uh, sorry, we, we want to help you if you're high risk, but we just don't have any money left to actually do so. Steve, did you want to make a comment on that one? <laughs> um, I think I've done enough. I think one of the big differences between the American system and what the U.S. system is that we have we limited the military cost of twenty five years. That means we get more than twenty five years better than twenty five years. And that is not true in most of the other countries. So I believe that's one of the biggest reasons. <laughs> no worries. It's clear that we have out there and assuming that we can do this all the way, the first year and the second year. Because of the whole economic world we have in the future, what do we really do as a delivery system for financial cost down, particularly in the Ooh, this is not, not, not as softball as, as you may think. <laughs> uh, the, at least the question part of it was, um, well, it, assuming the laws don't change now, what can we do as a delivery system? Uh, I'm very interested in medical informatics, com computer systems. Um, can that find ways to help uh, improve or reduce costs? Uh, maybe doing analytics to root out inefficiencies, fraud, waste, and abuse. That's an obvious target to go after. Um, are there other ways you can um, relatively automate mundane tasks that we spend a lot of that administrative costs on? Those could be some examples to go after. Um, so many possibilities there. However, uh, another thing I feel like I've learned from history is that every new technology, the, the idea is, oh, we'll have more technology, so medic medicine will become cheaper to deliver. It's almost never been the case. New technology almost always ends up costing um, healthcare even more. But uh, hope, certainly hope for opportunities to route inefficiencies. Let me get to Nigam because he had raised his hand earlier. Um, so, oh, that's such a deep question. I'm not going to get to everything, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
So I know what you're getting at too. So um, uh, people, the, it, in, in a typical lifespan, where most of your health expenditure comes from, it's in the last six months of your life. So why don't we have a better conversation about that? All these things you do in the last months probably aren't even, they're probably not even stretching somebody's life out. So what are you even benefiting getting them, but it becomes very expensive. Maybe informatics can do something about that. Say, could we, I think why it's hard to, one of the reasons it's hard to do something about that is, do you know when is the last six months of your life? Um, it's easy to say that after the fact, after you died. Oh, this patient died, look at that, they were in the ICU for five months. If only you know, we, we had done something differently. But prospectively, you, you, you don't know that, you have to make a guess. Maybe using informatics, predictive modeling solutions, you could make a better guess about who is going to be very closely approaching the end of the life. You can have much more targeted discussions about what they can expect to benefit from. Let me get Bob and you get your hand up, and I know Carl wants to comment on the last one, but. So, so I'm gonna help you out, Jonathan, with some Go for it. Paul's question. <laughs> it'll, uh, it'll address some of the things. One of the things that we as a faculty in medicine as well as our health staff program medicine have a conversation about is variation in care. One of the biggest ways we can use informatics to uh, help us in terms of streamlining costs to see the question is is there's a distribution in how we all work, how we all take care of patients, even very common conditions that have a pretty clear way of taking care of it, but as individuals, we think, well, I know a little bit better. And uh, that may be the case, but it's usually not the case. <laughs> and, uh, and so what we have to do, Stephen, you know this, I think that's why you asked it, we need to shrink the variation. And, uh, and there's going to be a lot of conversations over the coming year about this. But to Megan's point, I think there is some good news on the palliative care front. Uh, I don't know if Carl's here. Yeah. So Carl, Stephanie, and others, George Sledge, we are here, and Paul Heidenreich, we're initiating a set of conversations over the course of the next few weeks on uh, uh, goals of care conversations with our patients for some of the reasons that Megan has indicated. And informatics is enormously helpful in, in this issue in terms of being able to identify patients for whom those conversations might be particularly appropriate and to help direct their care. I don't know if Manali Patel is in the audience, one of our, our young oncology faculty who's been working with Arnie Milstein's group on trying to implement uh, end of life cancer decision making uh, and has some very provocative results, which she's asked me not to share. But, um, but I think you're, we're going to have her dig grand rounds in the coming months and you'll see some of the intriguing data she has. So informatics is, uh, I think, huge help. Important tool in a lot of these conversations. So thanks, John. Thank you. I, Carl, you want to make a last comment or we'll call it a day? Maybe close the thought, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's end it, right? I, I guess I'll just close that just for time. Um, responding to the question about what happens to say long-term care insurance, there actually was a provision in the original version of the ACA for the, the Class Act, I believe it was. It ended up getting taken out, basically. Um, I, I don't fully understand why it, maybe it was gonna cost too much. Um, and so it is also just strange compared to like half the people, or half many people on Medicaid, for example, actually nursing home patients, just because that's the only way they can pay for their nursing homes, for example. So it's not just poor people, for example. Anyway, obviously more we can talk about. Happy to hang out here and chat with anybody. Thanks so much for the conversation. Thank you.